Good Friday morning, everyone, and welcome to The Backyard Naturalist. My name is Tim. I work at the Urban Ecology Center here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and I'm delighted to be here with you today as we look at what has become an increasingly common member of our backyards and one of the largest animals in Wisconsin, the white-tailed deer, in episode 17 of season three of The Backyard Naturalist. A special thanks to the members of the Urban Ecology Center and a reminder that winter equipment lending is now up and running. So if you're looking to take advantage of all this uh, snow and ice soon, it's coming. And uh, an extra special thank you to all the subscribers to the series. You make this all possible. I'm tickled with humility that some of you purchase gift subscriptions to the series for your friends and loved ones and the holidays are not over. So there is still time to have people you know join us on Friday mornings at 9 a.m. with a gift subscription. On the human phenology side of things, tomorrow marks Christmas, an annual festival central to the Christian liturgical year, preceded by Advent or the Nativity Fast and marking the beginning of Christmas Tide or the Christmas season, which officially starts legally just after Halloween and is uh, <laughs> one of the many cultural celebrations that occur on or around the solstice. Uh, so Hanukkah was earlier this year. Dongxi in China is a celebration of ancestors, gods, and the return of the light. Christmas Day marks the first day of Christmas tide. When your true love brings you this red-legged partridge, Alec Taurus Rufa, not in a pear tree, in what was most likely a juniper tree, but apparently the words got a little mixed up in the translation over the centuries. So, uh, you get lots of more birds until day 12 of Christmas, which is the eve of the Epiphany, which comes right after Christmas tide. In much of Spain and Latin America, tonight marks the final night of the nine days. Many, many cultures celebrate nine days uh, of Las Posadas. And that's just not Christian. That's a lot of uh, cross religions. Nine days is, a, is, a, is central. Um, this is related to the nativity and specifically the lodging or the inn. And um, which is marked with reenactments. And tonight is known as Noche Buena or the Good Night. And the nine days leading up to Christmas is celebrated in Filipino culture with Simbang Gabi, which, mean, which is the night mass. And in Puerto Rico, these nine days are called Misa de Aguinaldo, all centering around the Novenarios or nine nights leading up to the birth of Christ. And Sunday marks the beginning of the six day celebration of Kwanzaa, celebrated in the Americas based on harvest festival traditions from mostly Western and Southeastern portions of the continent of Africa. And this multi-holiday season centers around the winter solstice, which this year occurred on December 21st at 9.59 a.m. Central, when the sun was directly over the Tropic of Capricorn. And this marks the return of the light to the Northern Hemisphere. And it's why so many religions and cultures celebrate around this time of year, um, and it can be really hard to extract what came from the Orthodox celebrations, what came from the pagan celebrations, what came from secular celebrations, came from capitalist marketing. Uh, so I like to focus on the astronomical event. In, in fact, there are some scholars who argue that Christ may not have been born during Christmas. It was maybe in an entirely different season. Uh, we went up on a platform in our backyard at 9.59 to welcome the sun. Um, and, you know, uh, the word solstice comes from the root words of the sun stands still. It doesn't actually stand still, but after six months of moving in a southern direction, it kind of pauses for a moment, stands still, and then starts to return to the north based on the tilt of the earth. Saturnalia was a week-long Roman festival rooted in, in paganism and was a time of feasting, merrymaking, and gift giving that sounds familiar that was hundreds of years before uh, uh, Christ and they were honoring the return of the sun god so this festival was so popular and many of these customs were later incorporated into other religious celebrations like Christmas uh, once Christianity became a major religion in the west the prehistoric monument of Stonehenge in England is perfectly aligned to point to the winter solstice sunset or maybe there's another explanation, uh, as my friend Paul Noth uh, told here, who's, he, his cartoons are often found in the New Yorker magazine. 
And uh, before I get off the holiday train, I will say I came across a very interesting holiday tradition that I think I could get behind called black cake. It's a traditional Christmas dessert throughout the English speaking Caribbean. It's a dense cake full of dried fruits, but don't get scared. Uh, a dense cake full of dried fruits steeped for months in rum, wine, and brandy and is not fruit cake. Uh, it's, it's a twist and many would say an improvement on the traditional European plum puddings and fruit cakes and pound cakes. So it's made with browned or burnt sugar which is similar to molasses, and it gives the cake a darker, more nuanced flavor that's much closer to like a moist chocolate cake than a fruit cake. And like plum pudding, these are often made during Christmas one year, but then aren't meant to be eaten until the following Christmas, which means the cake and the fruits uh, become fully saturated in the rum and the cherry brandy for a whole year. Uh, so you can order these online. They're fairly expensive, um, but it's something I'd like to try soon or you can try to make your own, but that seems really hard. So uh, with that, we will move from the human and astronomical uh, phenology to wildlife, to backyard wildlife and the white-tailed deer. So some of you might not still put the deer yet into this backyard wildlife category, but I think that's starting to become a minority opinion because uh, deer sightings are just becoming a, more and more ubiquitous, and B, more and more urban. Um, just during this recent rutting season, we had two UEC staff members that shared videos uh, of deer in their backyards, and um, deer are in all three of the UEC green spaces, uh, Riverside Park, Washington Park, and Three Bridges Park. Um, so what are they? Um, they are mammal animals in the eukaryotic domain, and we get into this in past episodes, what makes a mammal a mammal, but this is an entirely different group than any other mammal we've featured. Uh, so if we go down the white-tailed deer lineage after the mammal stop, the next is the order Arteodactyla, which is the even-toed ungulates. So Arteo from Greek is even, and then dactyl, finger. So even fingers or even toes. And so straight off the bat, when you look at this slide, the relatives of the deer, you see some pretty fun and, and maybe unexpected species. An ungulate describes an animal, it's usually a large mammal, that, that walks around on hooves. And uh, although the major groupings of ungulates are even-toed and odd-toed, that's a bit of a misnomer because just about every mammal came from the five-toed blueprint. Uh, so, you know, in a sense, we're all odd-toed, but uh, many mammals looked at that blueprint and said, you know what, I don't need to use all five of my toes to support my body. Uh, and so this group in particular, and there's 275 species, give or take, in this group, said, uh, we'll try to use two toes or four toes, and let's see where that gets us. Uh, except for the whales, which belong to this group, but got rid of their toes altogether. And the number of functional weight-bearing toes, a little side trip here, is a pretty good indicator of the speed of an organism. So things like elephants and flat-footed humans, which are objectively pretty slow, use all five toes. Uh, then hippos, which can run decently fast despite their weight, and then you get things like cats and dogs. They decided to run around on four toes, the pressure evolution. Uh, rhinos are down to three. Deer are down to two. And then horses, which one are, are one of the fastest uh, ungulates, have reduced the number of weight-bearing toes down to one. So uh, and then you get the whales that have zero. Um, so it's not an, an exact direct relationship, but it's, it's often an indicator uh, the number of weight-bearing toes will often correlate with, inversely correlate with greater speed. So fewer toes usually often means greater speed, more toes on the ground, weight bearing um, often means slower. Uh, and then again, they're ungulates, so they have hooves. And here we can see the footprints of some of the more familiar land-dwelling artiodactyls. Uh, and most of them are 
are, uh, they carry their body weight evenly between two of the five toes. Most often it's the third and fourth toe. And then the other toes either become vestigial, maybe disappear, uh, become a little spur, or, or they point backwards. So you might still see them in the footprints, but they're not doing as much, um, you know, in terms of weight bearing. Uh, the hippo is one of the few members that uses four toes, but four is an even number. So the hippo belongs here too. And then these are contrasted with the odd-toed ungulates, the perissodactyls, uh, like the rhinos and the horses and the tapirs uh, that bear their weight on an odd number of toes. And then one other major difference between the two groups, it's not just the toes, the even-toed ungulates digest plant matter in one or more stomachs as ruminants, like cows, uh, while the odd-toed ungulates digest their plant matter in their intestines. So... I don't know, something tells me that's going to come up in a trivia question someday. So uh, remember that when you're on Jeopardy. Within the order Artiodactyla, the deer belong to the family Cervidae, and this is the true deer. So there are other animals that we sometimes call deer, but just like we have bugs, but then we have the true bug family, we have frogs and the true frog family. There are deer, and then there's the true deer family. Um, and with only one exception, the male deer of all species in this family shed their antlers every year and grow new ones the following year, distinguishes antlers from horns, uh, which are permanent. And I'll take a quick detour on our path towards the white-tailed deer and just show you a few incredibly fun members of this family. So first up, the world's smallest deer, the pudu of South America, which measures about one foot at the shoulder, uh, weighs about 20 pounds, and looks like an animal that one of my kids just made up and drew at the kitchen table. There is the tufted deer of China that has fangs, people. This is a deer with fangs. This is vampire Bambi, and they live in China, Myanmar, and Tibet, and they use those fangs during male-male conflicts. And hopefully that's it. But it gets better because there's another species of deer with fangs. Seriously, who knew there were multi, there are more than one deer species that were fanged. This is the Chinese water deer. Okay. Um, the next grouping for our white-tailed deer, which is the subfamily Capriolinae, this is the New World deer, New World meaning the Americas, um, but that doesn't hold a lot of water either because several species in this group occur around the North Pole and so get into Europe and Asia like uh, reindeer and moose and roe deer. Um, but now this group is separating from the other group of true deer or other groups of true deer. Uh, and so we're, we're, we're separating our deer from the elk and the red deer and the fallow deer, um, but we're, we're keeping some of these familiar deer. And then we arrive at the genus Odocoileus. Uh, the root of Odocoileus is hollow tooth. So uh, this genus has three species that are still around today and all native to North America. And these are the closest living relatives to our white-tailed deer. So that includes the mule deer. And the mule deer often replaces the white-tailed deer in the West. So this is the Western deer. Um, and it's all the way from the Yukon in Northern Canada um, almost reaching into Alaska, and then they go down all the way into Central America, or Central Mexico, excuse me. And then there's a very local species called the Yucatan brown brocket, which is the opposite, and it's only found in the Yucatan province of Mexico. And then the other member is our very familiar and featured organism, the white-tailed deer, Odocoileus virginianus, which colloquially may be called the white tail or sometimes the Virginia deer. And you can see here that the range of the species is really extensive, all the way from Northern Canada, uh, south to Peru and Bolivia. And as is the story with many successful iconic backyard species, the white tailed deer has also been introduced uh, much further around the world, New Zealand and Europe and islands in the Caribbean where they tend to uh, be up to no good. But within its native range, it is the most widely distributed, distributed ungulate, uh, native ungulate. And of course, it can't compete with cattle, uh, but that's an introduced domestic species. But 
Um, one of the reasons that it has been so successful has been a lot of the conversion of the forest land that favors deer, particularly coniferous forests. When that goes to agriculture, it'll often be replaced with, with evergreen, with um, deciduous forests. And white-tailed deer tend to do very well, both with the agricultural setting and then the, the conversion to deciduous forests. Um, and unfortunately, this usually occurs at the expense of moose and caribou, which do better in, in the coniferous forests. Like many other animals, white-tailed deer follows both Allen's rule and Bergman's rule, meaning in the Northern Hemisphere, the farther north you go in their range, the deer tend to be larger with shorter legs, like the deer on the left, which is near Quebec. And as you head down towards the tropics, the deer become smaller and have longer legs, like this white-tailed deer on the right uh, in Costa Rica. And this is all about thermoregulation and surface area to body ratio because you wanna retain heat in cold climates and you wanna be able to lose heat in hotter climates. So a big buck in Wisconsin might be 300 pounds. Uh, some might reach 400 pounds and there is evidence that a deer in Minnesota tipped the scales at 500 pounds, um, but with all the hunting pressure today uh, and, the, and the selection with hunting towards smaller deer, it's just becoming increasingly unlikely to find really large deer anymore. And you think about it, even a 500 pound deer, which is huge, has nothing on an elk. An elk can tip the scales above a thousand pounds. And a moose, very closely related, uh, the, I think the largest recorded moose was at about 1800 pounds. So you're almost talking a ton when you're getting to a moose, four times as big as, three to four times as big as the largest deer. As we look at the characteristics of white-tailed deer, they're, they're fairly brown overall. They have kind of an underlying grayish white coat. Uh, but this time of the year, they, they, they tend to take on more of that grayish hue. So like the, the deer on the left uh, are, are kind of that grayish winter coat. But then in the summer, they, they sport a more reddish coat like the deer on the right here. And so um, here's a female that's shedding the red summer coat in favor of the gray winter coat as fall is approaching. So it's kind of easy to see that contrast. And like their teeth, many of their guard hairs are hollow and, and hollow hairs provide excellent insulation, uh, particularly in the extreme climates. And just like with humans, as deer get older, they tend to lose a bit of the reds in favor of the grays, uh, even in the summer. And then they get more of those hoary whites, especially in the face. Deer have acute vision and they can process images at a much faster rate than we can. And that allows them to do really well, especially in low light. So like overcast days or during dawn and dusk, they can see much better than, than we can. And when they sense that something is wrong, they will uh, flash that iconic namesake white tail and tell you I'm onto you. Um, but with the deer gains in detecting movement, it loses in distinguishing color. So some birds are, are tetrachromatic, meaning they have four color cones. Humans are trichromatic, meaning we have three color cones in our eyes. But deer are dichromatic. They only have two types of cones in their eyes. So they can detect blues and yellows, but they have a really hard time with reds and oranges. So that's why the blaze orange that hunters use is good at warning other humans of the presence. But for deer, it's fairly undetectable. OK, those antlers. So uh, bucks will regrow their antlers every year and the size and the branching pattern of the full grown antlers are related to how old the deer is, but also its physical condition, which can be influenced by local conditions, food and stress, um, and it's also uh, genetic. So most of the growth happens in late spring and new antlers are covered in velvet, uh, which is full of blood vessels, and this makes the growing antlers look much thicker and fuzzier. Uh, but once the antlers have reached their full size, the velvet is shed and the antlers stop growing for that year. And then once the breeding season is over and, and all the females have bred, they will shed their antlers completely in the winter uh, after which they become dog chew toys. Like the other even-toed ungulates, deer are ruminants. They have a four-chambered stomach like a cow. 
Uh, each chamber has a different and specific function and a different community of microbes. So this allows deer to eat a variety of different foods throughout the year. Uh, and it'll also allow it to eat food in one place and they digest it in a different place, which, which is good if the place that you're eating might be a little more exposed and dangerous, you can go to a, a more secure, safer place to digest the food. Um, and the very complex set of microbes and, and the microbes change not only between stomachs, but also through the year. So there, it, it's really kind of important from them from a phenology perspective. If they're eating the wrong foods at the wrong time of year, it can be really upsetting to their, to their gastrointestinal system. Um, so they will, you know, in, in one season be eating mostly leaves, then maybe switching to grass or acorns or grains. And it also allows them to eat plants that would kill humans, um, like poison ivy would be really dangerous for us to eat. Uh, but, and, and some mushrooms that would kill us are, are fine for, for deer. And on very, very rare occasions, you will hear about a deer eating a bird or a small mammal. Um, and if I hadn't experienced this myself, I probably wouldn't believe it. But when we were mist netting for birds in Shenandoah National Park, uh, there was a local deer that came to one net and got there before we got there and just started eating the birds right out of the net. Um, so we had to close that net. It was a really strange morning because we also lost a bird to a chipmunk. So, so who knew that chipmunk and deer uh, would be eating birds? Hey, Tim. Yes. We have a question. Um... If someone says they saw an eight point buck, does that mean it has eight points on each side or a total of eight? I am going to go out on a limb, go out on antler and say that it means the total. I bet somebody else on this knows. I don't know the answer to that. I'm gonna guess, yes, total, not precise. That's what I would guess too, but I also don't know for sure. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. There's some great hunting songs uh, particular from Wisconsin that talk about 30 point bucks and things like that. So when deer numbers become unnaturally high, uh, which is quite often these days, especially with the, the land conversion to agriculture I was talking about earlier, and in the absence of natural predator density, deer can be really destructive. Uh, one of the reasons why Chambers Island uh, I love going there with Robin because the, it's one of the few places where you can study vegetative communities without deer um, because they got rid of all the deer in the island. Uh, but, but just about everywhere else, deer, deer can be very destructive, especially if their numbers get up. Um, they, they're really destructive in the undergrowth. So they can clear a place out of, of native wildflowers, forbs, and shrubs, um, trees like hemlock. Can have a really hard time regenerating in areas with trees because the deer just love the baby hemlock saplings and will just eat them all up before they can grow to a big size so so regeneration can be really hard and um, oftentimes the the deer are eating the natives and then if you get exotics in that deer avoid um, they can take over a community even some of the natives uh plants like like um I'm forgetting the name of it now, Pennsylvania uh, sedge. Uh, I, I think they can kind of take over an area even though they're natural. So deer have a really important uh, force in, in the plant communities. Um, and uh, oftentimes it's bad when the deer become unnaturally high in density. Uh, when you have kind of a healthy plant community, the deer can actually increase diversity. Um, when, when things are kind of uh, the way they had been. And in these two photographs, you can see exactly how high the deer are reaching because the, you see the, they're called deer browse lines. Um, so you kind of like think of giraffes, how high they can get in an African savanna. Um, this is how high deer can get and reach. And then you just, you get these browse lines. And then pretty much everything from that line down is, is, uh, is gonna be munched up. So in a healthy ecosystem that you have top predators that keep deer numbers and other things in check. And, and that is usually the best thing to allow the plant communities to thrive as well. And these predators will often hunt older animals or animals that are sick or weak. And so it's thought that they actually keep the deer populations genetically stronger 
and this selects for kind of the larger, stronger animals. Uh, but today, this is by far the number one predator of deer. And in a well-managed system, humans can also allow for healthy deer populations, which leads to healthy plant communities, ecosystems. Uh, but unfortunately, hunting systems are subject to political and economic whims that are usually at odds with the healthy natural communities as we've seen over and over in Wisconsin. Um, and this can lead to smaller deer, which is probably not what the hun hunters want anyway. Um, if a deer senses a threat, it will usually do one of several things or, or combination of things sometimes. So if it's a lower level threat or it's just noticing, it might induce, the threat might induce this very raspy warning call, which kind of also lets other deer know to be on alert. Um, and this process is called blowing. And if you've ever heard it, it's really strange. Uh, I've had friends become super freaked out when they're hiking or camping by the alien sound of a white-tailed deer giving its warning huff. So let's take a listen in this short video. Um, and during the intro, also see if you, well, you can pick out the turkey gobble, but you'll also hear an elk bugle bonus. So here we go. So that's a blowing deer. And it's just an odd and, and kind of mystical and strange sound. Yeah, um, a quick oh, other ahead. question too. Yep. Um, uh, you had mentioned there was hunting pressure for smaller sized deer. Do you mean that small deer are preferred? Sorry, the pressure leads towards smaller deer, usually when hunters want to take the bigger deer. That's not always the case. And I'm not putting hunters in one box. I'm just saying often um, the hunters want to get the bigger deer. So that selects, this is a good, good qualifying question, that, that then just selects for smaller deer um, often. I mean, it's more complex than that, but it's, it's, and there are natural predators that will get this, you know, the, the fawns, but as far as like, it's when it's harder to get the bigger, stronger animals um, for, the, for the natural predators, then that selects towards those because they're, they're gonna, there's less of a chance that they'll be, you know, that there's more of a chance they'll pass on their genes. Um, but for a hunter with a gun, the, if, especially if they're preferring those bigger animals, that might lead to a pressure for smaller animals that might be passed up by a hunter. Um, and so then they'll be the ones passing on their genes. So excellent question. It's, it's again, more complex than that, but um, it's one of the forces. Okay. Um, so another tactic that I mentioned earlier is that uh, a deer that feels threatened will will flash that namesake white tail and bound away, usually in a zigzag jumping pattern, which signals to other deer that something's up, and it and it also signals to the predator, you know, I see you. Um, but if the threat becomes really high, they can run. They are one of the fastest animals on the continent, and they can get close to fifty miles an hour. Um, and when they're running this fast, it's tail down, it's all business, none of this like flashy, jumpy zigzag, they're, they're moving. And they're also excellent jumpers. Um, they, can, they can leap in one leap 30 feet uh, without their feet touching the ground. And uh, they can jump a vertical of nine feet. So they could almost jump over uh, a basketball hoop. And um, here we'll watch a video of a deer and that fence behind it is at least six feet. And I'm going to just kind of move ahead a little bit. With this. Here we go. Watch it from about here. I mean, you can, I mean, that deer was, was bounding pretty, it, it, it went from one end of that 
yard that was trapped in the 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 person who filmed it had opened up some doors and was hoping to kind of get it out the open door um but the deer spooked and and uh and just in case you're worried she said she 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 pretty sure that that deer landed just fine because as soon as she looked outside that deer had been like was already halfway down the the neighboring farm field um so incredibly fast incredibly good jumpers um and uh if none of these other things will work they can go into attack mode and uh, get up, uh and use those antlers as weapons so and if they don't have antlers they'll you know use that skull and and try to butt or use the um their feet and and they can be very very dangerous it's it's uh, not uncommon for people to get hurt um or even killed if they get too close to a deer um so uh incredibly beautiful um and and strong and it would be criminal for me to talk about deer and not show at least a few pictures of some fawns so here you go and you're welcome for this one um and one more and and one of the areas that deer tend to pop up at least in social media is how they often seem to develop friendships with other species other non-deer species um, so we're going to wrap up this white-tailed deer section today with just one of, one of the more touching stories that we found. Almost too touching. The first time Buttons brought her babies to meet our dog was an excitement for all of us. We literally are all shouting in the house, Buttons has brought her babies! Jibra, you look so innocent. Gibro is so gentle with her babies. He just loves on them. You pull your tongue big enough, you can almost force their whole face. Mm -hmm. He plays with them. But he's just as gentle as he could be. He just literally acts like another mom. And she just was like, my buddy's helping me. It's just been so special and she brings them back every year. It's incredible. We know it's a very unique situation, but special to both of them. I think Gibro and Buttons just mean family to each other. Gibro and Buttons have been best friends for 11 years now. They literally have grown up together and just had such a special friendship. He loves being clean by her, loved by her. He will literally just sit down in front of her and she must love it too because she always is cleaning on him. He loves buttons and he wants all the attention. Buttons will just show up at the door and that's when you know she wants to see her buddy. She'll even paw at the door if you're not answering it in a timely manner. Hey, sweetie. Gibro and Buttons' favorite activity is, I would say, hiking together. They love just hanging out. They love playing in the snow. When we first rescued Buttons, we had a friend that had raised a deer and somebody called them and said a mama deer was hit by a car. They called us and we had the knowledge from our friend of how to raise a deer. It took a lot of work, but our whole goal was to let her be wild, but also just become a part of the family. I think that's special for anybody to have a best friend all these years and I think they're both blessed to have each other. They have each other's back and they love each other and they will always remember and love each other. So I don't know, you know, this, this may evoke different 
emotions in, in different people, you know, and maybe, you know, wild animals should be wild and domestic and, 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 and there's those complexities. But to me, it's, you know, there are several stories, not just with domestic animals where a deer and something else will, will become friends. There's the, the hippo and the turtle and all that. And, and to me, it's more of, you know, this was a unique situation. Um, a, a little while ago in the journal Sentinel, there was a story of a turkey that had been raised in, in a house for like 12 years and then became wild and started doing all the wild things um, turkeys do, but, but continuing to visit. And so um, to me, it just really gets at the complexity of animal emotions um, and, and how new situations will bring them out. And again, I, it, I, I say this a lot, if, it, you know, if, if what we can think of as human intelligence uh, evolving over you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years, and then, and then mammals over millions and billions of years well, millions of years and then life for billions of years, you know, all those other lines in the tree have also been evolving during that long time. So in humans, it led to a very specific type of, of, of complexity of adaptations, but, you know, trees, mushrooms, everything else has also been evolving that time. And so just the complexities evolved in, in, um, in what we call emotions and, and other things. So, all right, let's move on if I can get this started again. Oh, the first time Buttons brought her babies to meet our- Okay. Um, all right, and I'm gonna see if I can get this. All right, well, we can keep moving. Um, so now we're going to um, kind of wrap up the, the white-tailed deer section and um, look at one of the white-tailed deer's cousins, uh, which is the reindeer. And uh, reindeer are associated with Scandinavia and Russia, and we have reindeer here in North America as well. We just call them caribou. And they're the only member of their genus, rangifer. So reindeer, caribou, same thing. Here in North America, uh, in Alaska, and the Northwestern Territories of Canada, Reindeer or caribou undergo one of the longest migrations of any mammal, and they're excellent swimmers, partly because they float really well. So one might call a reindeer a semi-domesticated animal. There are plenty of wild herds, but people in the Arctic have depended on reindeer for food, for clothing, for shelter, and they will actively herd wild reindeer, um, which is why we call them semi-domesticated uh, and uh, individuals will be fully domesticated. Let me just see if I can get this enter full screen. There we go. Um, there are individuals that can be fully domesticated um, and some of the wild herds can be kind of semi-domesticated and, and they'll use domestic, fully domesticated animals to help herd some of the semi-domesticated animals and help them in their migration. And so there's been long relationship between uh, reindeer and humans, and um, uh, they will milk them, they'll use their, their antlers, they'll pull sleds or sleighs, and one of the primary foods of reindeer, which live much farther north than our white-tailed deer, um, and, and uh, they're, they're prim one of their primary foods is lichens, and as well as trees and grasses. So uh, in my house, they've been known to favor cookies, carrots, and cocoa, uh, but in the wild, they specialize on lichen, which has given them an interesting optical trait because reindeer can see ultraviolet light. Um, and this is likely because lichens absorb UV light, which makes them really easy for reindeer to find uh, their favorite grazing plant. Incidentally, urine also absorbs UV light. And so that can provide very important information to a reindeer for example, if there's a predator around and it sees the predator's urine, it might know to, to stay away from that area. Or if it sees the urine of a competing male it, that's you know marking its territory where it shouldn't, um, that's all information for the reindeer. And here's a very important newsflash. Reindeer actually do often have red noses because of the high density of blood vessels in the nose. It's not just Rudolph. Um, and that high density helps them regulate temperatures in extreme cold. And another quick fun fact, it's very likely that all of the reindeer pulling Slanta's uh, sled, so Rudolph, Downer, Blitz, and all of them, 
they're probably all female because anytime you see reindeer on Christmas Eve with antlers, uh, and and both male and female reindeer do have antlers, uh, but if it's if they have antlers on Christmas Eve, they're most likely female because male reindeer will shed their antlers in early December, uh, and the females retain their antlers throughout most of the winter. And finally, just as white-tailed deer can eat mushrooms that are toxic to humans, so can reindeer. And one of the practices of shaman in the Sami culture in Nordic countries is that shaman will sometimes drink the filtered urine of reindeer in their practices. And so if the reindeer ate hallucinogenic mushrooms, those chemicals would end up in their urine and then ingested by the shaman who then under the influence of those mushrooms would probably watch reindeer take a sleigh way up into the sky. And the rest is history. So we will end the talk with 20 seconds of Zen for you to wrap up your thoughts and maybe carry some of this energy into your weekend. You ever notice sometimes when deer walk, they, they, they move their heads back and forth like pigeons. Um, look for that sometime if you have a video. But uh, thank you for joining me today. We'll be back here uh, on New Year's Eve. I will be back here on New Year's Eve. You're welcome to join me. Um, and I hope you have a wonderful weekend. And I will stop sharing my screen.